Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to the third in our series of wonderful lectures from this year's uh, Kyoto Prize laureates. My name is Callum Miller from the Blavatnik School of Government, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here for this lecture. In a moment, I will pass over uh, to Dr. Ron Roy from Oxford's Department of Engineering to introduce our speaker. But allow me just now to welcome not only those who have joined us here in the Blavatnik School, but also those joining us remotely to our friends in Cape Town, and even if there are some late-night roboticists in Canberra, you're all very welcome. And as I hope you know, if you have any questions for our speakers, please do submit them, and during the question time after the lecture, it will be our pleasure to uh, draw on the questions that have been submitted remotely. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here for the third in our series of lectures as part of this inaugural Kyoto Prize at Oxford. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Ron Roy to introduce our laureate. Thank you. A few notes here. As a uh, doctoral student at Kyoto University, Takeo Kanata developed the first completely computer-based system for facial recognition. Since then, he's devoted the bulk of his career to exploring the science of computer vision, which is the automatic extraction, analysis, and understanding of useful information from images or images. In the 1980s at Carnegie Mellon, he founded the NAV Lab, which is a pioneering project that developed techniques for vision-based autonomous vehicles, including lane keeping, automatic parallel parking, and object detection. He also co-developed the world's first direct drive robot arm, as well as several medical robots for surgical assistance. He pioneered virtual reality, which you'll hear about, I'm sure, in this lecture, the assistance for capturing visual three-dimensional scenes and generating modern graphics effects and for video and for live sports broadcasts. He is a recipient of many awards for his work, including the Franklin Institute Bauer Award and Prize for Achievement in Science in 2008, the ACM AAAI Alan Newell Award in 2007, the Okawa Prize also in 2007. His current title is UA and Helen Whitaker University Professor of the Robotics Institute of Carnegie Mellon University. So I'm pleased and honored to present Professor Takeo Kanade, who will share his insights into his various projects and tell us all about how to think like an amateur and do like an expert. Okay. Thank you for a nice introduction. I, I think today's my goal is to have fun, and uh, hopefully my talk is, uh, is, uh, interest, uh, is interesting. Uh, well, both technically and uh, also as an entertainment. I try to be an entertainer today. So, um, <clears throat> I think I've done a, uh, many different things. I tend to take on a project as my interest goes, and this actually shows some of the things that I, I did. I was involved uh, uh, in, during my career at Carnegie Mellon, uh, ranging from uh, mechanical systems to autonomous driving and uh, uh, autonomous uh, helicopter and, and so forth. Oh, the, by the way, when you, you see the graph over there, the horizontal axis, obviously, uh, uh, year 1980 to 90 and so forth. Vertical axis shows the degree of my interest. <laughs> and you see up and down and uh, uh, some project. I, uh, did once and never <coughs> regained my interest. But some project, it's going up and down. Now, <clears throat> well, while doing a lot of different things, uh, you tend to, you may have uh, a little bit of what I would call moment of fame. And uh, so, my probably the biggest fame is my appearance uh, in the Super Bowl. Uh, um, broadcast in 2001. Now, Super Bowl is a big deal in the United States. The, <clears throat> the reason that I was there is I developed with my colleagues a movie matrix-like uh, replay for Ameri uh, American football game. Uh, have you seen a movie uh, Matrix? Oh, I've never seen it. <laughs> But CBS people called, told, came to me and said, Professor Kanade, we want to do the same for uh, football. Uh, do you know how I, uh, Matrix is made? 
The <coughs> Matrix movie is made by arranging several, a few hundred cameras. You see all those dots? They are all cameras. They are set in the studio surrounding and pointing to the center of the stage where the actor acts. And at the right moment, all of those cameras are synchronized and take picture. And then one of the camera is ordinary movie, so movie camera, so it actually takes all of this. And at the right moment, takes picture of all surroundings. So it connects this one, which looks like this. This picture looks like this. That camera looks like this. That camera looks like this, and so forth. Therefore, you get the impression as if the time is frozen and you're spinning around, or he is spinning uh, through axis. So the idea is to do the same for football game. But you see, in the football game, the studio, the play, is big, you know, uh, 50 yard to 100 yard. And also, unlike a studio, you cannot prepare the particular location where interesting will occur. Therefore, you cannot do the same thing like movie matrix. So the idea is to actually prepare all those, make, change all those cameras to a robotic camera that can actually control pan, tilt, zoom, and so forth. So that at each moment, the <coughs> movie matrix uh, setup is made at a particular point in the field. And that point moves as the game develops. And then you now have a movie matrix scenario everywhere uh, in, in the <coughs> on the field. And you see here, those uh, we actually use 33 cameras. Uh, placed on this, and then they are connected to the control room uh, outside of the stadium. And then um, in, the, in the control room, there is a fake camera where the cameraman actually set, and he can actually move the camera as a cameraman. And then that is connected to any one of those cameras. So if, and then that camera's output is fed back to his this fake camera. So he actually thinks as if he is actually at one of the real camera and controlling that camera. And depending on that, all the rest of the cameras are actually controlled accordingly. So that's the whole system of the idea. So in order to do that, you need a robot, and we bought a PA-10, then one of the best uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries robots, about $80,000. A robot and threw 33 of them and bought one Sony professional camera. Each of that cost about eight to ten thousand uh, dollars with the high zoom lens and so forth. So, and then we prepared, we actually had a 120th scale developed at the basement of Carnegie Mellon and we practiced, developed uh, hardware, software, and practiced. And then the whole system moved to Tampa, Florida and placed on the second deck of the stadium. And uh, you, see, uh, you see all those uh, <coughs> dots, the, the camera, each one has that uh, set up. Uh, and then I even uh, cl climbed at the top of the scoreboard, you know? It's scary. <laughs> and from there to the other side of the, of the field, about 100 feet, 150 meter, so you can see how precise control you need in order to capture the player in the middle of the field. And uh, you see, uh, it's, uh, you see that some uh, difficulty of technical and uh, scientific difficulty. And it's a huge system. Each camera is connected to, as I said, the control room outside the stadium. And here's the control room. Uh, <clears throat> it's a truck. Uh, and the, the dis, even the cable from each camera to the control room is, uh, each one is 500 meter. So 33 of them. Cable alone is a more than 15 kilometer system. So it, you can understand that it's a substantial system. And here it is uh, how it worked. Now, during today's coverage of Super Bowl 35, CBS Sports will introduce a new technology called Eye Vision. He's a famous uh, sports.
You see, at that time, that was the, the memory. Today, it's probably about this size. And this is me. This is inside the control room. These are uh, ex-superstars. I met them. <laughs> This is a halftime show. So like that. So uh, you see, uh, that's where I was. And uh, you know, you know how much it costs if you want to have a one second commercial at Super Bowl? $100,000, one second. I was there for 25 seconds. <laughs> And indeed, that was a part of the contract between Carnegie Mellon and CBS. It clearly said, Clause 6, Professor Takeo Kanade must appear with his name and title clearly shown. You see my name and the director of robotics is shown during the broadcast of Super Bowl for 25 seconds. <laughs> and since then, I claim myself to be the only professor that has ever appeared on Super Bowl. <laughs> And that's true, by the way. And uh, so that was my, one of my, uh, probably the biggest short moment of fame. Now, uh, now when I ask many students, uh, researchers, including actually myself, what is my goal, my wish, your wish, as a researcher engineer? And most people say to do good research. I think you do, you probably answer that way too. But when you're asked, what is good research? It's not easy to answer that question. What is good research? Now, for that question, late um, Professor Alan Newell, he is famous, uh, he's a founder, one of the founders of uh, artificial intelligence, which is very popular today. Uh, he actually said a very profound thing, which and I think his, his guidance is we at Carnegie Mellon uh, still use. And uh, he said the following, good science responds to real phenomena or real problems. Good science must solve the real problems that exist, real problems, not concocted problems. Number two, good science is in the details. I think you have to be very precise in order to do the good, good research. Number three, the, the final real test of the grid science, he said, is whether it makes a difference in the world. I think Professor Newell, as deep as he, he is and uh, influential person as he was, uh, I think he, uh, I, I believe that he captured the essence of the, what the good research is. And so I think that's how I feel. Now, in order to do that, my observation about doing good research is that quite often successful research ideas are surprisingly simple or even naively trivial. Don't you have that experience that when somebody did the extremely good work and read a paper and say, what, is that all? I thought too. Why shouldn't I come up with this idea? 
is so trivial. And indeed, the, probably the best idea is often like that. Now, why such a best idea is not as easy as we think to come out. And I think I would claim the impediment to such a simple thinking is the I know mentality. In other words, expert knowledge. Don't you have that experience when you have got a good idea and tell somebody? The first person say, no, 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 that's not a good idea. That's not a way to do. That will fail is indeed the expert of that world, of that field. They tend to say, no, no, that's not a way to do. Indeed, professor, a professional, profess, a professional like us, professors, we have somehow, uh, you know, this uh, strong, uh, the um, uh, belief that we have to show that I know better than you. Therefore, when my student, or our students come up with an idea, we tend to say, don't you know that in 1965, so and so got the same idea and he failed. That's the wrong idea. And I think I'm pretty sure you had that experience. Yeah? So does that mean, however, that a good research can be done by amateur? No. I think real, in order to get the real result, idea is one thing, but in order to perform, execute it, and make it a real working theory, precise, profound, or if it's a system, to make it actually work, I think we need a knowledge skill of experts. For example, very simple thing, like uh, autonomous driving, we may think that when we think that the, your car is a little to the left of the road, then turn your wheel to right, and, and then it to left, turn this way, it may go straight. No. Unless you have the concept of control system where the gain of this chain action to correct the error, it will actually, your system will oscillate. You know, the, when you're a novice driver, you tend to weave. That's exactly, the gain is too high, yes? And that gain has to be related, it is actually related to the speed of your traveling. And without such a knowledge, even the simple thing that we may think, simplest thing, like go straight, is not achievable without profound knowledge of control theory. So that's the three observations that I saw. And then I actually summarize this idea as think like an amateur, do as an expert. I was so convinced that I even wrote a book on it in Japanese. And uh, the, the, actually this book was translated in Korean, uh, Ch uh, Chinese, but never translated in English. Uh, it's too bad. Uh, so I think I'm going to use a, a little bit of that uh, content of that book and then I, you know, sprinkle uh, various experience and a story to uh, present but I was involved in uh, my research. By the way, obviously, the worst thing to do is think like an expert, do as an as a amateur. That's the recipe of a definite failure. And uh, I think you, you probably get that idea. Quite, there are quite often uh, efforts like that which failed. So, my claim of in doing the good research, especially in engineering, is to make a scenario of success. I usually call it a story. Picture success. What can happen as a result if my idea actually successful? If it's done, if my theory, if my understanding, if my new discovery, if that's true, what will that bring about? What does that change the way we do? how and where it will be used. And think freely and with fun. Story will expand and you talk. That's very important. You talk with other people. And the more interesting, the more fun the story is, more expansive the story is, people join and the effort will become larger. Not just you, but the whole field will actually follow you and then that 
area of research, area of technology, area of science will expand. I think that's what I'd like to claim. So I like to show a small example of a many camera system. You know, iVision is one of them. 33 cameras, their system. And uh, how the, this whole many camera system that I worked for some time in my career uh, <clears throat> came to my mind. In early, in late 80s and 90s, the virtual reality was very popular to make, you know, to create the virtual world, artificial world, and you have some, you know, a simulation in it, and then you actually show it in a beautiful display. At that time, it was li limited than today's virtual reality device, but still, there was a big system like a cave that the whole room has actually display and inside you can feel as if you are in a simulated world. Now, why do we do that? I think the, my, my belief is that we do that because we want to do the simulation of the real world. While the simulation in the real world, we call it experiment, actually. Experiment. But when you do, in some, but in simu sim uh, virtual world, I think it's experiment is usually called simulation. Now, why do we need a virtual world? Because to do the simulation instead of real doing experiment in real world, because there are many cases where the experiment in the real world is either difficult, not desirable, or even impossible. For example, disastrous scenario nuclear accident. You don't want to test it in real world. In some cases, like a space, you cannot do it for the time being. So you need artificial world to do the experiment. So if that's the case, in addition to actually a, the, at that time the most popular area of research was actually how to display this experiment to world, to you to real world, which is go from virtual world to real world. But if my story is correct, isn't it more important, at least as important, to go the other way? That is to actually input, turn the real world to virtual world. Because the, go the reason to do the experiment in the virtual world is to do something about the ex real world experiment instead of, because that's difficult, to do it in virtual world. So I think this is the, how I started. And the first thing we thought is probably we should make three-dimensional model of the world. And we actually developed, probably at that time, one of the best 3D scanner. Uh, it actually uh, scan the beam go, laser beam goes this way and it has a two nodding mirror and a spinning mirror, spinning, so it actually spins 360 degrees uh, horizontally and about 60 degrees vertically. And at each moment, each point, it actually emit light and detect the dis timing, which actually the distance from that one, and create about four medium points in about a 10 seconds, 10 to uh, 40, uh, 40 seconds. So today, this is a very similar thing as a, the most advanced uh, sensor, Velodyne, which actually, uh, um, you know, Google's car uses. It's exactly the same format. Uh, but that, this is 1993. And this is, uh, it actually worked even outside with the sunlight. You see that building, and because we know the three-dimensional, we can actually create, you see, the simulated simulation. Uh, I have to emphasize, this is 1993, OK? 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And this is inside of the uh, museum next to Carnegie Mellon. And the room is scanned. And even the, the curator is actually scanned. and take a picture of this beautiful and put it to this 
created thing, and you can actually see. Now today, this is very common technology, but I have to emphasize this at 25 years ago. Now, people are doing this on a small scale, but I thought, in order to make it fun, I think we should just make it big. So I told my students, okay, make it big. Where is it? We went to Cape Canaveral, and here's a rocket launcher. Rocket launcher is a huge, huge structure. It's a building, actually. You know, so the one floor, at the top of the crane, the sensor is placed and the whole thing is captured. You see, uh, the chain and wires and everything is captured and uh, you can actually see what it's like, the whole building. And uh, we could do this. By the way, at this time, it was dot-com age. So we thought this will make it, this will make a big business. So my, I myself and my friend, we met a, com we, we founded a com company. We made a business plan. First year, we sell five units. Second year, 50 units. Third year, 500 units. Fourth year, our three of founders will be a millionaires. That's our business plan. We only sold one system, ever. <laughs> the reason is, everyone was so impressed. Wow, this is a big system, great system. As soon as they heard our price tag, 250, quarter million dollars, they said, oh, no, thank you. That's it. And, uh, but actually, we did a lot of things, like uh, modeling uh, existing building. Uh, we even went to uh, Egypt, uh, King to King's tomb, and uh, scanned the inside, and, and so forth. And we even put the, this sensor on the helicopter, autonomous helicopter, and flew over the terrain and uh, city and create the whole model of the city. Huh? And uh, which. At that time, it was new, and today it was, as you may know, commonly done. Um, but still, this is, this is a static world. It, take, it took 40 seconds in order to capture even one image, image of three dimension. So, whereas the world is dynamic, people, I mean, I move, okay? So, the scanning 40, 40 in one image, in one three dimensional image, 40 seconds is not as useful. So we thought, okay, we should do it in real time. How? I think we should make a real time video rate stereo machine. So we built one back in 1992. And we made, we used the five cameras, and the camera output not only a color image, but also a three dimensional image, uh, 200 by 200 by 8 bits. And you see, I'm doing like this, so my foot is closer, so it's wider. My two hands are closer, it's wider, and me and back, you see, three dimensional. Today, Kinect can do this, by the way. Kinect, as you may know, okay? But at that time, this took three million dollars to build this machine, three million dollars. And it actually had this VME board, it's a big size format circuit, 13 of them. We used 21 uh, chips of 11 by 11 uh, uh, convolution machine, convolution chip. Each one of them costed, uh, it's actually from England, GER, I think, uh, $500 at that time. And uh, this whole video rate steering machine uh, generated five kilowatts. So as soon as we turned on the machine, the whole room became warm. Yeah? And surprisingly, by the way, one year after we demonstrated this, people began to actually do it in software. We were a little bit disappointed, but I thought that by showing the possibility, people actually picked it. That's possible. Why not? Yeah? So we thought it's fun, and but and then we realized that if we have actually a camera that can compute distance as well as appearance, which is ordinary camera can do, then we should be able to move our viewpoint to a different position and create a synthetic image. 
you know, because we know three dimension, we know appearance, so if we move our viewpoint, how that world will look like is computable. That's exactly what computer graphs can do, yeah? So we should be able to do that. But the problem is, in the, from the original view, there are portions which were occluded, not visible. And that portion will begin to be visible when you move your viewpoints. So there will be a hole. You don't like it. So how to remove it? I said, simplest idea is to put more cameras so that that portion is visible. Yeah? Well, there are other places that are not visible. No problem. Put more cameras. Put as many as you want. And so, here's the idea that we should cover the whole room. You see, small dots, they're all cameras. <coughs> then we can capture the whole room. And here's a scenario. Famous surgeon is doing surgery. Many medical students want to observe. Today, some, only some limited number of students are actually allowed to be inside the, at that time, inside operating room. Don't worry, we make the whole room captured, three-dimensionally virtualized, and put it in CD-ROM. See, at that time, only CD-ROM, not DVD. <laughs> and then medical, poor medical students buy them and see it in, in time. So, the medical students can be anywhere, from surgeon point of view, from nurse's point of view, or even from patient point of view, is possible. And uh, so, as soon as the hallmark of Carnegie Mellon is, as soon as you think, you do it. So we actually built one back in 1995, 51 camera system. Small, you see all those black dots? They are cameras, Toshiba's camera, 51. It looked like a Hitchcock movie, you know, birds. <laughs> and all of them are actually synchronized electronically, and at that time, it was not, it was possible but not realistic to capture 51 camera system output into computer. So we actually bought 51 video tape recorders, you see over there back, 51 video tape recorders and connected. And when the experiment is over, one well, video tape is taken out and put it in the digitizer when it's the finished, the second one, this, third, this, and then because they, or each frame is time-coded, we know which fr this frame of this tape th corresponds to that frame of this tape. We know that, okay? But when you have 51 cameras and 51 VCRs, doing experiment is not easy. Even starting the experiment, you have to push 51 start buttons. So my students complained. Professor Kanata, you are a professor of robots. Why don't you build a robot to push the buttons? I said, no. And students said, complain. Why? I told, because students are a lot cheaper than robots. <laughs> and this story actually uh, was, uh, were, uh, you know, worked pretty well. So anyway, uh, we built it. And once we do it, uh, something occurred inside is actually captured, three-dimensional model which is changing, and now you create, of course, synthetic court. And you can see the events from anywhere you want. Uh, this is about 1995, and this is about 2000. Now, by then, the whole system is digital, and you can actually see I thought this is fun, but this wasn't sold as well at this time. I think uh, maybe it's too much. Now, these days, by the way, uh, you see a lot of uh, video uh, media of this type. Uh, well, maybe at that time, there was a little too costly, number one, and the quality was not as high as we want. So the whole thing, we, I named it virtualized reality, because it's not virtual, it's real. But virtualized, real world is virtualized. Virtualized, mouthful word, virtualized. So I call it virtualized reality. And the slogan is, let's watch the NBA on the court. The NBA court is covered by the full cameras, 
and completely digitized so that you can watch the game anywhere you want, even inside the floor. And if Michael Jordan, at that time Michael Jordan was a star, if he actually dunk, you can actually block him. Huh? Now, it's easy, because he does not know you're there. Uh, so uh, it's interesting. And uh, so today, if you look at this way, multi-camera system is everywhere. Entertainment, I think you see quite often eye vision like sports and stage video. Large scale 3D modeling is very common. Uh, Multi-aperture cameras, uh, everywhere in focus, optical see-through cameras available. Security and multi-camera 3D microscopy. Uh, microscopy is even large number of cameras, and uh, 3D microscopy is now available. However, when, I, when we ro first wrote that the first video rate steering machine, can you believe this? It was rejected. I thought that was one of the best papers that I wrote, but the paper was rejected because the reason of the rejection was Device that use this many cameras, that use five cameras, unnecessary cameras are too expensive to be useful. And this is the comments by professional computer vision researchers. It actually it even said that. This device can be built by people like Professor Takeo Kanade, who has so much Research dollars can build it, but no other people can build. Therefore, it's useless. That was a comment, a real comment. And you see how terrible? And today, terrible the expert concept is today, five cameras, nothing. 50 cameras, nothing. 100 cameras, nothing. Yeah? So, I usually go the other way than most people say. So, okay, if you say, you, if you don't like five, if you don't, don't like 51, okay, go bigger. And uh, we actually built 1,000 <laughs> camera system. Uh, right now it has uh, more than 500 cameras. And the whole room, this one, is completely digitized to the level of individual ray and C. And we're, uh, some of my colleagues and the students are actually making some interesting things, and uh, I'm not going to talk about it. So the next thing I'd like to talk a little bit is um, <clears throat> fun to build systems that work in real world. I think the system, my belief is, it must work in real world. Otherwise, they're not useful. They have to work. And they, are, they have to build in that way. Um, so I worked uh, quite a few uh, type of things, space thrust uh, work, crawler, you know, space shuttle. Uh, space uh, has, space station, for example, has this uh, truss work. And uh, at that time, how to build the truss work, uh, we actually uh, built some experimental system that actually crawl uh, the truss work carrying the component and connecting it to the next one and use it to go to the next one and self-build itself. Uh, computer assisted surgery, I did some work in that area. Uh, large scale video surveillance systems and autonomous helicopter and driverless car. And I can't go every one of them, so I just want to show a little bit about the last topic, the driverless car, because that uh, is quite uh, interesting topic today. Um, we, our group actually started uh, a driverless car around mid, early 1980s. And originally, we started a small uh, robots uh, on, on our right hand side. It's called Terrigator. And at that time, you, you see, the, it was, technology is so different. What we can do today is so trivially was not possible. Number one, the computer was not big enough to do anything meaningful on that small one. So what we actually had, camera on it, and we actually had a license of VHF channel, which broadcast 
this video from that robot. We receive it as a public broadcast, our own channel, digitize it in our computer room. I will use the VAX 780, then the big machine, and process the video and decide where to go. And that command is radio linked to this one. And that's how it, one, one cycle, how it worked. But the problem is that when that machine is moving, the person at the site cannot tell whether it's, it's moving with a good reason or it's just actually going straight. So it was, experiment was so inefficient, so we thought that's not a good idea. We built, we should build more self-contained system. So we built the next one, we called NavLab. That is a truck which contains a camera, onboard cameras, laser range finder, and then at that time, it, Sun micro systems workstation, beginning of the workstations, uh, was a start time, and we had a three or four machines on that machine. So we call it onboard sensors, onboard computers, and we had one more important component. Because this is a truck, we can actually carry people, so we had onboard researchers. And we told our students, you share the fate of your program. <laughs> so you should write a reliable program, and that's how we started this Paul project. And uh, uh, this is the beginning. Uh, in the very beginning, by the way, it's the very beginning, it moved only one centimeter per second. It's so slow that the gear system of the truck cannot allow it. So we had to modify the car so that it can move that slowly. And moved in the, uh, you know, uh, the park next to Carnegie Mellon, and this is public road. And move it, and then a child comes out, and then you see that's a scanner, half quarter million dollar scanner. Only one system in the whole world at that time and uh, three-dimensional data, and uh, stop. By the way, that ch the child, which can, which can, he's a son of a programmer who wrote the code to stop such a dangerous situation. <laughs> and this is about uh, 1990s. We began to venture to public uh, the freeway, and about 40 to 50 miles per hour. Um, this is about 95, and this is Navlab 5. It has its own camera, small camera then, uh, our own uh, radar, and the onboard computer, and uh, uh, user interface, and uh, we could do, uh, you know, actually show that the uh, lane marker tracking, and this, uh, Two dots is the, its understanding where the rain mark is, and then this blue box is uh, relative position with respect to the rain markers. And the blue box is the vision detected the car, cars in front of it, and, and so forth. You see, the machine detects the car in front of it. So th those are the kind of thing that we could do uh, then, uh, early on, 85 to 90 to 95. And we built machine, one to five. And we actually, we built six to 10. We built the 10 machines uh, toward the end of, uh, till the end of this project. And uh, the biggest event was probably 1995, we de made a demonstration, which we named No Hand Across America. Two researchers actually drove this thing from Pittsburgh all the way to San Diego across the United States, about 3,000 miles, 98% of which was computer vision controlled. Now, of course, that was a person at the driver's seat, okay? but he should not drive, so he was doing like this, 
you know, the steering wheel like this. Whenever something goes wrong happens, I hold it and then begin to drive. We used to say that the being this is being on a driverless car is more tiring than driving yourself because it's you can't tell when you will be given the control. Yes? Or you, you have to decide that. Uh, and by the way, this, that particular problem is still the real problem of today's driverless cars. It, one of the issues. When, how the driverless autonomous, autonomous car should give the control to human driving until we'll, we'll have a complete driverless car. Okay. And actually we went to uh, San Diego and we went on to uh, Los Angeles. We met the famous people. We actually showed the car to, you see, uh, the left, right, right hand person is uh, me. Uh, next, and then the left two people are uh, Todd Diocom and uh, Dean Pomelo, who actually did the work and actually I joined and went to LA and uh, met that middle guy, uh, Jay Leno, the famous comedian, Jay Leno. Why? Because he used, he uses the newspaper article in his uh, program every day. And uh, the NavLab uh, article was actually used in his show. He read, here is an article. Thanks to Carnegie Mellon University researchers, now it's possible for the first time, for the first time, that you can take your hands off wheel and do makeup or read newspaper or drink a cup of coffee. And Jay Leno said, why is it the world first? In Los Angeles, people have been doing that forever. <laughs> so that was his joke. And we thought, OK, we have to show this to Jay. And then we went to the studio and actually had an appointment <laughs> and showed this. And as you know, um, this is not my work, but uh, 2007, uh, DAPA Urban Challenge, uh, my colleague Dr. Red Whitaker and the team won the competition. This is complete autonomy. No driver is even at the driver's seat. And today, as you may know, um, as you know, that the basic uh, um, capability like uh, lane following, vehicle detection, pedestrian detection, traffic sign detection, all these things are already available in your car as a driving assistance. That those technologies are with us today. And autonomous self-driving cars are in sight, as you know, many people are working in this area. Our next stage is can the robots have a genuine understanding of the whole scene, not just where the lane marks are, where the object is, but what, is, what the world is actually doing. Is that person going to actually cross the road or not? In order to have a genuine understanding, I think it's the next level of the, of the challenge that, uh, that we are facing. So let me show you one uh, more recent activity that I'm involved in. Um, it's, we call it smart headlight. You now, when you drive at night, rainy day, you see that it's very difficult to drive because the rain appears to be white dots and blocks your field of view, okay? Now, rain is actually, raindrops is made of water. Water is transparent. Why transparent raindrops appear white dots or streaks to us? Because that's because of us. Because we shine them with our headlight, yeah? With our headlights. Raindrops are circular, therefore they act as a lens and reflect the light back to you. That's why, yeah? So, if you don't want to see them, the solution is trivial. You change your headlight with the projector, you know, the conference projector, where each ray is controllable. 
And when you see the rain coming, you actually turn on and off individual ray so that the rays won't hit the raindrops, but only go between them, then you won't see the raindrops. And the lights will hit the background and reflect back to you, and you will see only the background. Isn't that trivial? <laughs> obvious thinking, obvious. Now you may wonder, is it really possible? And it's surprisingly simple. Why? Number one, rain is not that fast phenomena. Rain moves at most 10 meters per second, which is a very slow event to us. So if you actually capture the rain in one millimeter exposure time, then they indeed are drops, unlike uh, streaks. Our vision is slow. That's why they appear to be streak. Okay? So what we should do is we actually place our projector and camera at the same position. Now, physically, it's not possible. Therefore, you use a reflector and place it in a mirror. Then this will accomplish to coincide the line of sight of projector and camera. So what we do? At night, you turn on your headlight very briefly for a few to 10 microseconds. And then quickly take a picture. Then you see the dots where the raindrops are. Now luckily we're talking at night, and as I said, raindrops will appear bright. Therefore, by thresholding, you know where the raindrops are. So you see, raindrops are in this direction, okay? As soon as you see it, what you should do is turn off the corresponding ray of your projector so that it won't hit that raindrops any longer. That's all. Now, it takes a little time to do that. Can take a pic capture process and so forth. So by the time you know what, what to do, raindrops must be moved a little bit, okay? But, so when you see the raindrops in this direction, the right thing to do is right above it is, is probably safe because raindrops will move away. Below it, dangerous because the, probably the raindrops will be there. So turn off that beam. Sideway, little above, is probably okay. This way, this way, well, who knows? Wind may blow, blow raindrops this way. So a little dangerous. So you may, you may have a sort of a danger map probability. So what you should do is turn off the ray inverse proportionally to this danger, yeah? Then you can accomplish the task. Now, of course, this means that you cannot 100% if your goal is not to hit the ray at all to the raindrops, best solution is, again, trivial. Turn off your headlight. <laughs> but that won't do. Okay. So the goal is to increase the throughput. So all that you have to do is to put space light modulator, which basically means projector, and camera, and connect it to, with the computer. So we buy a headlight, exactly the conference projector, and modify it. it. Today's projector is made of DMD chips, many uh, array of small mirrors. And uh, they can be controlled very fast, up to 2,000 frames per second, 2,000 hertz. But for projector, it needs only 60 hertz. So most projectors that we buy don't have that interface, so we replace it, okay? And then connect, put the camera in front of it. And box it. And put it on a car. So we have a new Headlight on a car. When you see rain, you see, you don't see them. Of course, we designed that way. When you see snow, you see less. 
Now, this is artificial snow. Okay. Now, probably takes time for this to be actually usable, or even you may not want it. But probably the first application that you have, you can do is to get the same idea. So, so the whole idea is now you change the whole concept of headlight from a floodlight projector to individually controllable headlight, raise controllable headlights. Okay? Once you do that, then for example, you know, the high beam and low beam. When you're driving at night, when this guy is high beam, you're blinded for a short while. And the scary, state, scary uh, thing is that 55 years old, old, like us, like me, I'm older than that, takes eight times longer to recover from this glare than 16 years old. During that time, we're dri actually driving, with, driving blindly. Isn't that scary? So what we should do, what we should do is, when we see the incoming car, all you need to do is turn off the beam, which will hit the oncoming car's the driver's eye. Then he won't see your car is has a high beam at all. Yeah, is that easy? Of course it's easy because at night, if you see a big round object, two of them coming at you by making that, that becomes bigger and bigger, it's more separated it's most likely headlight. Then in the, you know, in the UK, this side is where you are. Okay, so turn off that portion of the ray. Yeah, so if you do that, then you see, our own view, we have high beam all the time, but oncoming driver, to him, our car is not a high beam at all. It's a low beam. Indeed, if it's perfect, he would see my car even with headlights off. Yeah? That doesn't work that, that way, of course, because light comes other direct from uh, you know, uh, mutual reflection. And once we know that, then we can do a lot more different things. Like uh, we, we know today, where is a driving rain, lane, a uh, car knows that. A uh, car knows where the pedestrian is, where the uh, bicycle is, and then therefore uh, we can actually turn more lights toward them and show the driving lane, especially in the country, in the, in the road, countryside, and that will make it more safe. And uh, you can actually, um, put this kind of thing small, and uh, put the truck, yeah? So, uh, I'd like to actually uh, conclude my talk with a little story about the value of research. I usually say newness is not virtual. I think we are too concerned about new in doing our research. My point is that newness is not virtue. There are lots of new things which are useless. I think the useful thing is whether it works or not. And, but uh, I have a more story, but I am run out of time. So I, I tell you one thing. In general, however, even though I say this great statement, it's very difficult to predict the value of research. Here's one story. There's a problem in vision called tracking problem. Is one pattern in the first frame, and it, it, the task is to know how much it moved in the second frame. It's called tracking problem. So the task is to get that value u, vector u, two numbers, u and v, you know, horizontal and vertical movement. It's a very basic problem, and the simplest solution idea is make a small window and search in the next window and to see whether there's a same pattern. And that can be summarized as, um, as gx, which is the small window, minus fx, difference of fx plus u. u is the shift view. And 
you make the difference, compute the difference between each individual pixel and square them, square the difference and sum over the window. And then if the two patterns are exactly the same, that should be zero. Therefore, the correct answer should be U that minimize this error, okay? Now, this is a fundamental problem. And the, the easiest way to do is you compute that EU for all possible U and, and then decide which U will give the minimum, okay? But it takes time, even when the computer is fast. And this is a very important problem, and we're working on it in the early 80s. And my students, Bruce Lucas, came to me. Takeo, we got a, I got a good idea. And I asked him, what is it? And he said, well, you know, U, which is a movement, usually is small. Therefore, we should use Taylor expansion of fx plus u, and then if you use only the first term, then fx, f parenthesis x plus u is fx plus derivative of f times this small displacement u. Then now you see u, which is unknown, comes out of that function f, and if you put that fx plus u substitute in the original one, then eu now becomes a quadratic, fun quadratic function of u. Now we know minimum or quadratic function is here, which is computable. Even high school students can do. Now, of course, we're talking two dimension, so it's a little more complicated, but you can get explicit. This, is, this should work, Bruce said. We should write a paper, he said. I said, no, I don't want that. And Bruce asked, why? I said, Bruce, this is not new, you see. Newness, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was thinking new is important. This is not new. You know, Taylor expansion has been known 300 years. This is not new. And what you did is the derivation, that's high school student can do. And I don't want to write a paper on a Taylor expansion and derivation, which high school students can do, and then my reputation will go down. You should not write a paper. And Bruce was very persistent. I should write it. We should write a paper. So I told him, okay, you can write a paper. But make sure you write a paper in a very obscure place so that nobody would read it. <laughs> and indeed, we wrote a paper, and we never published any journal paper, never. Guess what? That paper turns out to be the most cited paper of my whole life. <laughs> Indeed, more than 10,000, uh, probably more, citing, the biggest cited paper. And if Bruce listened to me, I think the Keo Kanade today did not exist, I think. <laughs> so since then, I always tell students, what your professor says is probably wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so don't listen. Okay, so finally, I'd like to conclude my uh, talk with, let me see, with last encouraging statement that um, also I uh, modified from Professor Newell. Final message. I think, I, I, I hope I give you an example of fun of research and I always took some problems and don't worry, there are enough problems in the world. Interesting ones, useful ones. They are waiting for you to solve. Problems are waiting for you to solve. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, we probably should start with questions from the audience. Does anybody have a question? Press Naki? I can take one here. Yeah. So, um, from our colleagues, I believe in Cape Town, Professor Kanadi. Do you think the headlight can see through snow and rain is realistically going to be available to consumers in the near future? As I said, uh, well, technically it's uh, absolutely possible, as, I, as we have demonstrated. Uh, now, 
In real life applications, always the cost and so forth and the benefit of the device uh, does that match with the cost. And uh, automobile industry is the one which is very strict about it. Uh, in automobile, $100 is a big, big expense. So it's an, it's, uh, I think it's, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. But I, as I said, the whole concept here is not just the rain raising, I mean erasing function. I think the concept is change the concept of headlight from the device to which a floodlight goes out, but control individual ray. As soon as you do that, there are lots of other things that you can do. One of them, maybe, maybe not. I don't know, but I, I hope that's true. And then I, one more statement I, real, I didn't talk is we should realize that projector and camera are dual. The only difference is direction of light. You see? Projector, you have a light source, hit this DMD chip, and this DMD chip controls the direction and goes out. Actually, camera is simply opposite. Light comes this way, and you can actually think of a device which has a DMD chip, which controls the direction of the collection of that light onto the CMOS or C, uh, CCD chip. You see? The whole thing is dual. And once we realize that, we can think now have concept of projector camera system, not camera, not projector, projector camera system, combination of that, and our system is one of them. And this has a lot more interesting applications and concepts. So that's the point I'd like to you know, uh -huh. convey here, which I told story, scenario. Any, any, anybody in the audience with a question? Let me jump in then. Yeah. I, I, I'm not sure this is from one of our friends in Canberra who's been doing some late night viewing, but they wanted to ask, uh, you talked about the motto of Carnegie Mellon uh, saying, if you think it, do it. Uh, that's great if you're at Carnegie Mellon and you have considerable resources. What's your advice to uh, researchers who have less resources as to how they can still experiment in the way that you've done? Uh, of course it's a challenge, but the we the research is, takes a step. And at Carnegie Mellon, we are lucky to have a, a little more resource. So we tend to go uh, fairly substantial demonstration early on, but you don't need to. I think that if you have small scale, clear demonstration of your concept, then people will follow you. And that's possible without spending too much money on it. And I really encourage people, don't stop. Oh, this might work. Well, if you think it works, then come up with an idea to demonstrate that, that idea with, with the small. And uh, I mean, there are famous, uh, even a Nobel Prize winner who said he got the no, uh, Indian Nobel Prize winner. He said he got a Nobel Prize with only $100 by uh, developing a particular device. Uh, Ray, I think uh, Ray, uh, Raymond uh, uh, discovery. Um, so I think a uh, similar thing can happen in a in technology area too. Yes, go ahead. So, uh, you just wait for the microphone to come, sorry. Um, you emphasize that the quality of what you do is very important, but also you, you said that having a good idea, which could be obvious, is, is also good. When you, were, when you were approaching your work, maybe in the earlier days, how did you balance uh, developing sort of technical skills such as programming different languages and understanding hardware compared to sort of reading papers and understanding what the state of the art in terms of knowledge is? To me, they are the same, by the way, you see. Um, I think the key thing is how, how you think and whether your thinking is really asking the um, essential question, you know? 
say, oh, we should do this. Then, well, if it's possible, then what happens? Uh, if, it, if you do it, what happens? And so forth. And that habit will help. For example, I have one example. Many people say, oh, uh, parameter A, uh, A uh, is, smaller A is better. And I, I challenge my students. Okay, uh, my students said, oh, one of my students said, oh, parameter A, smaller the better. Therefore, I set it 0 0.1. I said, that, that's strange. If smaller the better, why don't you set it 0? And I said, oh, if I set it 0, then the program doesn't work. Well, that means that your statement is wrong. Something is wrong about your thinking. So I think that you have to have a habit of, when you say something, what does it mean, actually? And, when, and then ask maybe the opposite question. Yeah? If so, this should be true. Is that true? If that not true, what original statement may have some flaw in it? I think that kind of a habit will help you. And uh, so once you do that, then I think implementation is very important, especially in engineering. I think we know implementation, actually testing it, will, is one cycle of your thinking. It's obvious. So faster you do, you're able to do, you can do a better job, faster. Yeah? And uh, I, I'll tell you my saying. Who said it first is not important. Who did it, or who get there first is. And I, we know that, right? You and I know that. Question out of the back there. Way back. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Kanadi, thank you for your talk. You mentioned that it's important uh, to also take, take into account uh, how your research is used. And often technological advancements have both positive and negative impact. So I can't think of any negative impact of the research that you have cited, but uh, inventions like the Bitcoin or encryption of messages on instant messaging services can often um, lead to encouraging trade of narcotic substances or even that of terrorism, et cetera, et cetera. So if a researcher can identify these consequences ex ante, how do you think they should sort of go ahead with the research? Do they leave that question to regulation or a matter of policy or say that it's going to be solved in the future? Or how, how do you sort of go about squaring that circle in some sense? Thank you. It's a very difficult question. Uh, by the way, you said that what I, said, what I did may not have any negative impact. I think it, it can. Anything I said, if anybody wants to do, can be used in, in a lot of different way. So I don't think, in my honest with you, technology does itself does not, except the extreme case, technology itself does not decide the nature, virtue, uh, virtue or, you know, um, or uh, vice of, uh, it's, it's virtue or vice. I, I, I think it's how it's used. Now, it's probably our responsibility to make sure at least we show the positive side of it and hopefully people will be convinced and use it for goodness of the of the world now if you notice the possibility it might be your our responsibility to mention it but usually what happens is there are enough people in the world who are smart or you may not call smart um, who can see that way of using it we cannot prevent that. So I think, uh, we, as a scientist, I think at least the good thing I, I like to see, from my minimum I like to see is show the positive and excitement and how it generate good thing, good, good, good thing. That's our responsibility, primary responsibility. And I'm not saying we should get away from the social impact and so forth. But being sort of uh, shrunk, shrunk by myself, by ourselves, I think it's a probably wrong thing for us to do. Sorry, it's, it's such a difficult question. Yeah. So I have one question from uh, Brian Stanswick, who has uh, contacted us to say, you've 
found many successful ideas, but to get there you must have had some that have failed. Could you tell us about one? <laughs> <laughs> many uh, people ask that question. By the way, I, uh, if I say, it's probably it's too arrogant if I say uh, no, no. <laughs> but uh, to a certain extent that's true, to the point that I have a feeling that I'm a very persistent person, like Bruce was, <laughs> that once I get idea, I keep pounding on it until it does something, uh, something. and there are enough examples of, of that. Mm -hmm. okay. um, now, there are some, some I, I don't know what, certain things that uh, it doesn't still do anything good to me. For example, I had some idea of what we now called modular robots. You know, put the arm uh, and so forth, and then connect and so forth. We built one. Uh, the the problem of that idea is that we could not get away from the fact that more you put, the especially if you make want to work in three dimension, then the base, the components closer to the base has to be bigger more powerful as you put more. And in the space it's okay, but in the terrestrial application, we could not get away from uh, this gravity problem. And uh, I myself was not as successful in that area. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yes, right here. Yeah, th thank you very, for your talk, very, very interesting. I'm just got a quick question because I'm sure um, okay. you've been, uh, co companies throughout your career have, must have tried to scope, sc scoop you out of CMU and take you to work for them. What's kept you in academia the whole, the whole time? I was lazy. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to, uh, certainly I was uh, uh, approached and I felt found uh, it in, uh, possibly interesting to work for industry. Uh, I don't know, I, I, I simply uh, don't have a particular reason I, I, for not having moved from uh, academia. Maybe implicitly or unknowingly, I was attracted by more, quote, freedom. But in the U.S., uh, as you may know, uh, you really have to work hard for getting uh, funding and so forth. And some people think that is not really freedom at all. So that reality exists. Um, so I don't have a, I, I think, I think a bottom line is I had fun. I had fun. And I, I uh, recommend that you will do what you feel Fun. We you. have time for one more question. I think. A, a, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. My question is, uh, why do you think your book hasn't been translated into English? <laughs> <laughs> Probably the biggest reason was I don't speak Korean. I don't speak Chinese. Therefore, I don't know how it was translated. <laughs> and as perfectionism, perfectionist as I am, I would, I know if it were translated into English, I would work on it too much. Mm. And I don't want that. <laughs> I spent too much time on writing the book on it. Uh, I had, it actually had a, a large, uh, many uh, jokes and uh, stories, which I'm most uh, very proud of, and I wish I could translate uh, all of them uh, to English. But someday, if I don't have much work to do, then I will. <laughs> okay, I think we have to call it, call it for now. I'd like to thank Professor Kanadi one more time. Thank you.
and may I on behalf of the Blavatnik School and the University thank you all very much indeed for being with us in the audience here and online. It's been a real pleasure to have you and to have your questions. Thank you very much for being part of the first Kyoto Prize at Oxford. Good. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Yep.